Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Kiyoshi Masui. Uh, he's a professor at MIT. Uh, Kiyo has led a broad range of really pioneering work in radio astronomy, uh, ranging from instrumentation to theory. Uh, and today he'll be talking about fast radio bursts with chime. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about fast radio bursts, uh, and in particular, uh, how this sort of new generation of digitally driven instrument, um, uh, namely Chime, is um, is for the first time giving us sort of this wide field view of, of fast radio bursts and letting us uh, sort of figure these things out. Uh, okay, so just to get started, um, uh, there we go. Oh, no. Uh, there's a lag on, on Zoom. Okay. Um, so first off, what, what are fast radio bursts? Uh, so fast radio bursts are single radio flashes uh, that are uh, very brief, so they're typically milliseconds in duration. Uh, they're broadband, so they've been observed from 200 megahertz all the way up to 8 gigahertz. Uh, they're bright, uh, so a typical fast radio burst will have a peak flux of something like 1 to 100 Janskys. Uh, so a Jansky is just this uh, uh, unit uh, flux that's used in, in radio astronomy uh, with a one Jansky source being the brightness of a typical radio galaxy in the sky depending on what frequency you're, you're observing in. So there might be one, one Jansky source in every square degree, uh, uh, and that would be a, a radio galaxy. Uh, and these are uh, cosmologically distant uh, 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 bursts, uh, but typically we don't, they're very poorly localized, so we don't know exactly where they're coming from. Um, they're almost certainly related to neutron stars in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so that just comes from that short time scale. So they're milliseconds in duration. Uh, so just by causality, the, uh, uh, the light emitting region can't be bigger than a light millisecond. Otherwise, you'd have geometric broadening. broadening. Uh, and so what does the light millisecond? It's about 300 kilometers. Uh, and so the only object in the universe that we can think of that is smaller than 300 kilometers that might have the energy reservoirs required to create a bright radio flash as a neutron star uh, uh, or something very exotic. So neutron stars are almost certainly, uh, are, are the, well, are at least the most vanilla uh, explanation for what uh, be, could be causing fast radio bursts. Uh, perhaps the defining feature of fast radio bursts is this uh, a property called dispersion. Uh, so that's just because uh, we observe these broadband bursts with many, many wavelengths, but not all those wavelengths travel at the same speed uh, through uh, the universe. Uh, so the universe is filled with, fill, full, filled with very diffuse plasma. Uh, that plasma has a refractive index, um, and that refractive index is wavelength dependent. So that's what it means to be dispersive, as so you have a ref uh, wavelength dependent refractive index. And so because of that, the shorter wavelengths, the bluer light, if you will, but these are all wa radio waves, these bluer, the bluer light travels through the medium a little bit faster than the longer wavelengths, okay? And so you, it ends up arriving at our telescope slightly before the, um, uh, the, 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 lo the longer wavelengths. So you wanna see what that looks like in real data. Uh, here's some, some data. So this is a dynamic spectrum, okay? So it's just showing you, you know, the amount of power received in our telescope as a function of both time and radio frequency. Uh, if you look at a single frequency, so that's like, uh, you know, looking along here in time, you see a bright flash right here that goes away and that flash is about a millisecond long, but that flash happens at a different time at each one of these frequencies, right? And that's that dispersive delay, right? The shorter wavelengths, the higher frequencies have traveled through the medium a little bit faster, arrived at our uh, telescope a few seconds before the longer wavelengths. So it turns out uh, that um, uh, that delay that we see uh, is proportional to the wavelength squared. With the proportionality constant being uh, involving fundamental constants that we know, and this thing called the dispersion measure. The dispersion measure just is the column density of intervening electrons, right? So it's just the line of sight integral of the electron density. So it's an area density of, of free electrons. Okay, uh, we measure it in these uh, kind of funny units of parsecs per centimeter cubed, right? Uh, so that's just because this ds is normally measured in parsecs. This, this ne is measured in inverse centimeter cubed. Um, right, uh, but but this is really you know the the one one factor of length cancels out, right? So this is an area density, uh, just uh, in some some kind of funny units. Okay. Um, and so every one of these fast radio bursts gives us a very precise measurement of this dm, right? So you know this this delay, the total delay is sort of seconds, uh, and the duration of the burst is milliseconds. So you measure this quantity to a part in a thousand for every single fast radio burst. 
Um, and uh, this is really powerful because it counts up every electron along the line of sight, every free electron along the line of sight, including uh, contributions from the Milky Way, the intergalactic medium, and from the host galaxy. Um, and, uh, and typically, actually, it's the IGM that uh, dominates, which has uh, uh, led to this uh, famous McCart relationship, which is that uh, this piece of the dispersion, um, you expect that to correlate with distance, right? Because the more IGM you had to travel through, the more, the bigger that integral is going to get. And so for the handful of fast radio bursts for which we have uh, host identifications, therefore we get optical redshifts, you can measure where the FRB is and redshift and you measure its dispersion measure, uh, and you get a, 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 a fairly strong correlation, if not perfect, right? Yeah. Uh, because this is, uh, this is just to pay homage to uh, J.P. Mackhart, who died, uh, published this in 2019, and also died in 2019, um, but, uh, or 2020, very shortly thereafter. Um, there are now a whole half dozen more data points on this plot. Um, but not not actually dramatically more. Um, maybe it's maybe there's a few dozen more, but it's it's there's not there's not a huge number of data points beyond this. Um, okay, and uh, so the other um, uh, uh, last thing I'll say by way of introduction about fast radio bursts uh, is that they're super abundant. Uh, so in the first decade of this field, from 2007 to 2017, something like 50 fast radio bursts had been observed. But that's only because you had to be super lucky to see a fast radio burst, right? Um, uh, you have to be looking at exactly the right place at the right uh, at the right time. They only last a millisecond, so you get one shot at seeing each one of them. Uh, the field of view of a typical radio telescope, like GBT, might be you know a, a tenth of a square degree, right? And so um, and so you see a tiny fraction of all the fast radio bursts that occur. But if you extrapolate that to the full sky, it's something like thousands that occur over the full sky every single day. Okay, so um, in order to actually figure out what fast radio bursts are, right, we need a bigger sample, right? Uh, and uh, in order to get have a bigger sample, you know, I just argued that our current radio telescopes aren't going to do the trick. So we need uh, a new type of radio telescope. Uh, and uh, and so let's let's think about how do you design a telescope that can see more than you know a few fast radio bursts per decade. Uh, and uh, before and in order to motivate that, let's think about you know what limits. Uh, a radio telescope like this one, the Green Bank Telescope, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, what, what prevents it from seeing uh, uh, lots of fast radio bursts? So um, a radio telescope works just like an optical telescope, right? It has a big mirror, okay? Uh, and, you, uh, and that mirror has two jobs, right? So you have incoming light. Uh, and so one thing you want to do is you just want to collect a lot of light. So you want to make this mirror as big as you can, right? But you also want to have the geometry just right so that you focus this light up at the focus Right, so you want all the path lengths to be exactly correct, right? So that the um, light adds up constructively at the focus, right? And that gives you amplification and gives you, you know, sensitivity to dim sources. But it does another thing for you is it points the telescope, right? Light coming from a different angle will add up in focus at a different place in the focal plane, right? And therefore, I'm only sensitive light to light coming from a certain place, um, uh, meaning that I, I have resolution, right? I have the ability to point my telescope. Um, so uh, the, the limiting factor, the thing that makes this expensive uh, is in the radio, you have to make these things really, really, really big, okay? So I can't just build like, you know, if I want to see, you know, 10 times more fast radio bursts, like you, you can't just build 10 more GBTs uh, because they're just really expensive, right? You know, the, the mirror is the size of a Canadian football field. Um, uh, and, uh, and it has to point everywhere on the sky to with sort of arc minute precision. That's just crazy expensive to build. Okay. And in fact, the camera you put at the focus, right, that's a small fraction of the total cost, right, because the total cost is just building this Eiffel Tower-like thing it has to point everywhere in the sky. Okay, but um, with new technologies, you might uh, consider building radio telescopes with a completely different approach. So in particularly two technologies that I would, um, that, that have been kind of game-changing here uh, is uh, the, uh, the dramatic decrease in the cost of computation driven by the computer gaming industry, namely graphics processing units. Okay, uh, so that means that digital signal processing has come way, way, way down in, in price. And so you can do a, a lot of, of computation really, really cheap. And the other thing that technology that we're going to, to make use of is the commoditization of radio frequency electronics, right? So the, the, um, the amplifier that's at the top of GBT, 
right? That, that cl actually collects the light and gets it into you know, an electrical signal on a wire. Um, that's like a $10 million amplifier, right? It's cryogenically cooled. Uh, it has to do all kinds of fancy things. You can afford to spend any money you want on it because you know, this thing is really, really expensive, okay? Um, uh, now you, in your pocket, you probably have an amplifier that is only um, twice as noisy as that one on GBT. Uh, and it costs like 37 cents, right? Uh, and so if you have these two technologies, and, and there's a whole bunch of other types of RF electronics that go along with that, right? So, um, so if you have these two technologies, you can take a completely different approach. Uh, so what you might think of doing is uh, just carpet the ground with antennas, right? And just collect all the light, okay? Um, and then you, uh, and so that gets you that light that does the, one of the jobs of the mirror, which is getting all that light. The other job of the mirror is, uh, and you can afford to collect all that light because the amplifiers are free, right? And you don't have to spend $10 million in each one. Um, but the other thing uh, that then you still have to focus that light, right? Um, but then you just focus that light offline in digital signal processing, right? And instead of using the big mirror. Uh, okay, so how does that work in detail? Uh, so one way to think about this uh, is this process called uh, beam forming. Okay, so imagine you have an array of antennas like this, uh, and you have some incident wave front you want to be sensitive to. I want to point my telescope at this signal. Okay, uh, so these antennas, uh, they digitize, you have an amplifier right there, you digitize the signal. Okay, uh, they each see this light with a different delay, right? So I apply some steering delay here to line up all this light, sum it up, and I get constructive interference. I've pointed my telescope at that direction in the sky. Okay, I imagine there's another uh, wave front that I don't want to point my telescope at. Okay, so, I, uh, so when I apply, these have a different set of delays coming in. And when I apply the same steering delays, I don't line up my light. I get destructive interference when I sum it, and I have not pointed my telescope in that direction. Okay? So this is the advantage that I can point my telescope anywhere in the sky I want with no moving parts. Right, so it's one of the big cost drivers for GBT. It brings it way down, but it has the added advantage that I can point it everywhere on the sky simultaneously with a no moving parts. Right, I, it's all just software. I can just duplicate that as many times as I want and point my telescope in as many different directions on the sky as I want. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or CHIME. So CHIME is a um, digitally driven a telescope operating between 400 and 800 megahertz. It's a very large field of view and high sensitivity, allowing it to detect something like a thousand fast radio bursts a year, which uh, is still an order of magnitude higher than all the other telescopes on the planet combined, which is something like 50 per year. Um, uh, it's a collaboration between these institutions. You know, Toronto was a founding, uh, and in fact, Toronto and in fact, CETA were founding institutions of the CHIME collaboration. Um, uh, and is you know how I got involved uh, because I was here. Uh, uh, so how does it work in detail, right? So the the chime informer. So I lied to you a little bit. So chime does have a big mirror, right? It does focus the light, but it only focuses the light in the east west direction, and is uh, and is flat in the north south direction, right? So it's uh, so it doesn't bother to focus that light. Okay. So that means any antenna that we put up on the focal line here, it has um, sorry, and the beam former was made by uh, by Cherry. Uh, who's also in here at Toronto, or uh, is at least partially appointed at, at Toronto. Um, so each one of these antennas sees a broad swath of the sky, basically horizon to horizon, north, south. Um, but there isn't just one antenna at this focal line, there's a whole line of antennas, right? And so I can do this beam forming process in the north-south direction, giving me both sensitivity and spatial information north-south. And there's not just one of these uh, cylinders, but there's four of these cylinders. So you do a an additional stage of beam forming east-west to give you additional amplification and additional uh, uh, spatial information. Yeah, it's because um, that digital signal processing step goes as uh, um, uh, goes as the number of antennas squared. So we still, even with those dramatic decreases in computation, we still can't, can't quite afford to carpet the ground. Although, you know, Chime was built with basically 2015 technology. Uh, so today you could come pretty close. You, would you mind? That is indeed what Whaley is doing. Who's talking? To me? Would you, sorry, it's Renee. Hey, sorry. I'm oh, hey. Would you mind repeating the question uh, next time? That would be amazing. Uh, okay, yeah, indeed. Uh, so the question was, why, um, why do we bother having this mirror? Like, surely I just motivated that you should just carpet the ground with antennas. Uh, and the answer is that computers aren't cheap enough to do that just yet. So you still need the, the big steel, steel reflector. Thanks so much. No problem. 
Um, okay, uh, so, uh, oh, uh, yeah, so I, one thing I forgot to say, right? So Chime has no moving parts, right? So it just looks straight up all the time, Sirius at the meridian. Um, uh, uh, however, fortuitously, the Earth turns uh, and um, we are able to map the entire Northern Hemisphere every single day. Uh, okay, um, so some details, right? So it's at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in uh, the interior of BC. I already said it was from uh, operates from the 400 and 800 megahertz band. Uh, it's an, roughly an 80, 80 meter by 80 meter total aperture, giving it about half degree resolution, making it sort of the same scale, although not quite as big as the GBT in terms of uh, the collecting area. Uh, it's uh, instrumented with about a thousand of these dual polarization antennas along the line of sight that participate in this beam forming uh, process. Yeah, so the question was, but any given receiver is not getting 80 by 80 uh, 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 collecting area, you know, square meters of aperture. That is absolutely correct, right? They only work, it's only in combining the signal from a thousand dual polarization antennas that you get that full aperture. Uh, however, I get, once I do that, I can point that telescope in many directions simultaneously, and that's what gives me the multiplexing. Uh, it's a digitally driven uh, telescope, right? So the heart and soul is not of, of Chime is not that steel on the ground, but it's the giant computers that were, um, again, designed here in Toronto um, that, that drive it. Um, so uh, that has uh, uh, 2,000 analog to digital converters uh, operate uh, that run on, um, that are digitized on 128 FPGA boards, producing about uh, 6.7 terabits of baseband data every second. Uh, which gets processed by a 256-node uh, cluster, each with four GPUs inside of it. Okay, so all these work together to do 6.7 peta operations per second, so pet peta multiply adds every second, which is about six times uh, as many as the ALMA correlator, which is the next biggest correlator on the planet. Um, so, the, but the real uh, power of Chime, uh, I think, um, and the things that's, that those unexpectedly game-changing for it was this idea of commensality, right? So the fact that, you know, trying points, not by some scarce resource of pointing my telescope at some place, but it just points in the same place all the time, right? And you can just data, uh, and so that happens digitally and you can copy the data once you have it digitized. And therefore you can feed many, many backend science cases at the same time. There's no scarce resource of telescope time. And so you just, you just duplicate the data and you feed as many backends as you can afford to build. Right, so you can do this twenty-one centimeter intensity mapping, which was the um, uh, the 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 thing it was built to do. But this the but you can also do the fast radio burst search, which is what I'm talking about today. There's also a twenty-one centimeter absorption system search, uh, multi highly multiplex com pulsar timing instrument, and a slow pulsar search, all operating at the same time, twenty-four-seven. Um, so the FRB search that I want to talk about today. Uh, so the uh, car. Uh, I don't actually have, so uh, Dick asked um, about the 21 centimeter absorption system search. And a uh, question is how sensitive is it? Uh, I don't have the um, forecast memorized, um, but many or uh, in forecasts, many orders of magnitude more absorption systems than, than are known. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, the ultimate goal uh, here is to be able to uh, monitor the Doppler shifts or the Hubble uh, the redshifts of these very narrow absorption systems over sort of decades and see the, the Hubble constant change. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but currently that's, that system's still in commissioning. You mean HMC? Yeah. So does that mean W? No, no, uh, what you get to measure is the acceleration parameter, I believe. Oh, same thing? Yeah. So we can do acceleration parameter just the absorption system. I mean, the original intensity mapping, the key thing was that one was capturing the VAO. Yeah, the, that, this is a completely different yeah. the thing, right? This is this is this is literally just looking at the redshift of one system yeah. and does it change next decade? Yeah. Uh, but actually, but you have to, but because one system's not sensitive enough, you have to do it over for like ten thousand or hundred thousand systems. I actually don't remember know the numbers off the top of my head. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's a whaley idea. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, yeah. 
Um, it is still in commissioning. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's taking data. Uh, they're trying to get to work. Oh, I, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have no concept of what the forecasts are for the, the LTs or, uh, sorry, I, don't, I can't comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, you would, in, in particular, you would discover these systems with Chime. You wouldn't monitor the redshifts with Chime. You would do that in, with another instrument. Um, okay, so um, now to drill down on this FRB search pipeline, which is one of those F uh, those backends. Uh, so it forms a thousand of these beams on the sky, so it points to the telescope in a thousand different places at a time. Each one of those beams has sixteen thousand spectral frequencies over the over the band, uh, has both millisecond time sampling, uh, and that's all processed in real time by a hundred twenty eight node CPU cluster, um, and it has to happen in real time. This data, you know, you multiply. Uh, sorry, you multiply those two numbers, those two numbers divide by that number and you get a data, uh, a data rate that's much too large to write to disk. And so this search has to happen in real time. Okay. Um, so this is uh, great, but uh, it has some limitations, right? So this, that, those specs are highly optimized for discovering FRBs, but they're not so optimized for studying FRBs once you, uh, you've discovered them um, uh, because you have limited time resolution, right? The FRB is like a millisecond long. But you, that if you have millisecond time resolution, you have no opportunity to go after a substructure. Uh, similarly, in frequency resolution, uh, and in particular, our ability to localize events is kind of like the chime diffraction limit, which is like a quarter of a, quarter of a, a degree, which is not great. Uh, so fortuitously, so the, the system that I was most involved in building for chime was this uh, uh, triggered baseband recording system, which tries to overcome all of these limitations. So what you do is, um, you know, in this, stage of the pipeline, before you do the steering, before you point my telescope, right, you take your, uh, your co phase coherent measurements of electric field, and you tee them off, and you put that in a 40 second ring buffer over here. Uh, and then upon discovering a fast rate burst trigger, uh, you read out this buffer and write it to disk. Okay. Uh, so this is the advantage that's completely lossless. So there's no information this telescope collects that you couldn't extract from this data. You know, this is this is the rawest data that the chime could conceivably uh, collect. You haven't even pointed the telescope yet, right? Uh, you are polarization sensitive, right? Because you um, uh, you haven't thrown away that information that was thrown away in the search. Uh, your uh, time and spectral resolution is limited only by this uh, by the uncertainty principle, right? Just a, a fundamental rule of Fourier transforms is that the product of your time resolution, your frequency, your resolution can't be better than one. Uh, and uh, critically is, um, since I haven't pointed the telescope yet, I get to point this telescope offline. I get to point it in as many locations that I want. And so I can dither around my source and find where do I point my telescope to absolutely maximize the signal noise, right? And so that allows me to super resolve to get a factor of roughly an order of magnitude and a half higher localization, right? So that's the same way that, uh, say, Gaia uh, is able to do astrometry at much better than its PSF. We can do much astrometry much better than our diffraction limit because we can dither, we can repoint our telescope in offline analysis anywhere we want to maximize that signal noise. Uh, okay, so we've made a bunch of progress on so you know the the the, the overarching question in the FRB field is you know what are the progenitors? What's the astrophysics that's causing FRBs? And we've made a lot of progress on there, this, which I won't go into detail. I'll just highlight a couple of results in a second. But we have you know made detections at new frequencies where they haven't been observed yet. Uh, observed yet. Uh, there are subpopulations of bursts that emit sources that repeat emit repeat bursts. So individual sources in the sky where you see more than one fast radio burst coming from. Um, but although that's only a small fraction of the total population, most FRBs are one-off FRBs. Uh, there is one of these repeating uh, sources is active on a 16-day period, right? So it uh, it gives bursts in a four uh, gives off bursts in a four-day window every 16 days. Uh, there's an FRB with 100 millisecond time. Uh, millisecond time scale quasi periodicity. So we have, uh, have periodicities of different sorts on very different time scales. Uh, there's a repeater that we've localized to a star forming region of a nearby galaxy. I'll talk about, a little bit more about that in a second. A globular cluster, an M81, uh, and a fast ray burst emitted from a galactic magnetar. So to, to sort of um, uh, zoom in on this last one first. Uh, so 
uh, we did see this fast radio burst coming from a galactic source is SGR 1935 plus 21. So it's a soft gamma ray repeater or magnetar is another way of saying that. So here's the radio burst that we saw. Uh, uh, here, I've this is like that dynamic spectrum I showed before, but I've taken the dispersion uh, uh, delay out of here. So we've, you know, all that, all that, that sweep that's just been undone in, in analysis. So you can see it all lined up here. See these two nice bursts coming from the source. Uh, and it is uh, temporarily coincident with uh, uh, X-ray bursts uh, that were observed from the same source, right? Which, uh, which sort of nails the association between these two sources. Um, uh, so this, uh, this radio burst from a galactic source was much brighter than anything we'd ever seen before in Chime, but it's also much, much nearer by. So, you know, in, in terms of intrinsic luminosity, you want, what is it? Right, uh, and it really is an FRB, right? So if you look at spectral luminosity, right? So how, um, so taking out the distance effects um, uh, versus transient duration, you know, here are where the FRBs live. Right? These are the millisecond sort of Jan uh, uh, sources that are about one Jansky, but at you know gigaparsec distances. Here are sort of pulsars and RRATs and stuff. So these are parsec or kiloparsec distances, but but at similar uh, flux, but very different intrinsic luminosities, and this. Burst was sort of hundreds of kilojanskis in brightness, but but at parse, kiloparsec distances. Uh, and it turns out in this space, it's much much more FRB like than pulsar like. So it really is. If, we, if this had happened in another galaxy, uh, uh, we would have interpreted it as a fast radio burst. Although not quite as bright as the other fast radio bursts. That's just because um, uh, the ones that presumably live down here in other galaxies, we can't see they're too dim. Uh, and and in fact, here there's a bunch of other things that we do interpret as fast radio bursts that are less luminous than um, than, than this this, this uh, 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 burst from a, a soft gamma ray repeater. We saw it off beam, right? Yeah, that's right. So the, this flux measurement um, was really really hard um, because we saw this 30 degrees outside of our field of view. Um, uh, but uh, we still had, so it's in a far side lobe and we had to know the telescope response in that far side lobe, which is suppressed by a factor of a thousand compared to our boresight response. Um, uh, that's actually the origin of this sort of dis, this grading structure you see here. That's none of that's intrinsic. That's just from the telescope. Uh, I hope that our RFI flagger didn't um, nuke it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it would have been. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess it might have triggered a baseband dump, which would have been, would have been great. We would have had polar imagery, but um, but since it was off course, like we didn't get baseband there's for it. No, analog with no, I mean there's saturation that happens, and but I don't think that would would have happened here. Uh, it's still less bright than the sun, I think. I think. Um, all right, so um. So this really points. So the fact that that was a magnetar that gave off a fast radio burst, you know, uh, this, you know, magnetars are you know, young neutron stars that are powered by energy stored in extremely strong magnetic fields, uh, right? And Chris invented them. Um, so uh, before Chris was born, there were no magnetars in the universe. <laughs> uh, so these are the favored sources of. Uh, so even in, in fact, even before this observation, these were the favored sources of fast radio bursts. Um, but you know now that that's very solid just because of this direct association. But even before that, the energetics, the short time scales, uh, the uh, association with star formation in some cases, although uh, I'll come back to that in a second, uh, uh, are all sort of fit nicely into the magnetar hypothesis. Uh, and then you know we had these observations of periodicities, both hundred millisecond uh, periodicities and longer time scale periodicities. So you can get these with you know, different uh, types of binary orbits or processions or something, right? And so that all sort of fits uh, just fine into this magnetar picture. And so, so you know, you might say, oh, we've, we've solved it, right? You know, FRB, all FRBs are coming from magnetars, uh, case closed, um, uh, let's do something else. Um, however, um, uh, uh, that's the effort, the information's a little bit more mixed than that. So when we look at source environments of uh, fast radio so, there's a few FRBs that we've managed to um, localize, in particular these repeating fast radio bursts. They can be followed up in, um, because they repeat bursts, you know where to look. You can follow them up, and you can follow them up with VLBI to get super precise localizations. And so that's uh, what was done here. And so we've localized this fast radio burst. 
Uh, so it's in BLBI, so it's super precise. So you can't even see the uncertainty regions. It's that little dot there. Uh, and you see it's coincident uh, with the star forming region, right? So you say, okay, good. Magnetars should be in star forming regions, right? They're, um, they're super young sources. Uh, however, uh, when you look in detail with a sort of HST follow-up, you see that it's actually 60 parsecs outside of the star formation. It's actually not consistent with being directly in the star formation. It's actually 60 parsecs out. Uh, and uh, given magnetar lifetimes, it's actually kind of hard to get a magnetar to be 60 parsecs outside of where the star formation is happening. Um, and so that's actually kind of um, uh, mixed in terms of the magnetar hypothesis, whether you can, can get this environment with magnetar. So that, you know, 60 parsecs, you might wave your hand a little bit and say, oh, you know, that's, that doesn't seem too hard to me. And I, I kind of agree with that. Uh, this one's a little bit more convincing, um, which is uh, we've localized another one to uh, M81, but not in M81 itself, out in the halo. Uh, and when you uh, localize in detail, where is it coming from? It's coming from a globular cluster inside the M81 halo. Um, and um, and there you shouldn't see a magnetar because you know globular clusters are very old stellar populations. They haven't birthed a star in like a, a couple billion years, right? And so there's no reason to think that you should be able to have a magnetar uh, out in a halo uh, 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 globular cluster. So that's really really a sort of a challenge for the magnetar model. So um, so you know I think the evidence from source localizations and environments are very mixed on uh, the magnetar hypothesis. But that's all. But that's with you know two data points, right, or a handful of data points. So it's hard. Extraordinarily so. Yeah. This is the, the so the 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 uncertainties from VLBI are just zero, right? Like you know at this precision, like frame tie, nothing, none of that can 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 get you an, uh, outside the angular coincidence. And then you just ask, you know. Uh, what else is there? And it's like not well. There's a background galaxy here, but um, but you know that 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 globular cluster is perfectly well aligned. Like it's it can't be. Center I, yeah, I, but I don't think it's outside of like the half light radius. Um, so, yeah. um, so we, we are we actually have uh, uh, we we're struggling to get HST follow up for this, but uh, are we sure that can't make the yeah. So um, that's that. That, that's for the model builders, not for me. Um, but um, uh, I think I've heard many different things. I was talking to Elliot uh, Katart the, the other day, uh, and he uh, he likes making them out of um, out of white dwarf binaries um, as a, as a channel. And and there he semi convinced. So people argued that no, you couldn't do it with like an uh, that you like you can make magnetars with accretion accretion induced collapse, for example. Um, but that should be too rare for it to be the first and nearest by FRB you ever saw. Um, however, you know, there's counter arguments to that. Uh, uh, oh, this one, I don't know the exact redshift, but like, you know, it's too, however good we know the distance to M81, which is presumably sort of percent level. But. No, no, no. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think I think the if you ignore the DM, I think the chance uh, chance of chance alignment is negligibly small. Um, the DM doesn't add very much to that because there's uncertainty uh, in what the halo uh, 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 provides, which Amanda you know has written a whole paper on, so you should totally ask her about it. There is an argument source being isolated. It's, uh, yeah. No right. Yeah. And our act, you know, these fast second pulse lines that occasionally go off, half a dozen first particulars. Right. So this is weird. You know, I mean, yes, you could have some internal thing that doesn't have a period resting, but the channeling of the energy is very much, it has to be on a symbolic stuff, and it's running like that. Mm. And for there to be no, you know, sign of that yeah, and I think it's not from lack of searching. Like people have searched that with every algorithm under the sun for periodicity and haven't found anything. So. Yeah, it's weird. Um, all right. Uh, however, that's base. That's only from a few data points. Um, yeah. So uh, clearly, so uh, this leads into that we'd like to um, do better than a few data points for the environments, at least, if those are giving sort of the most mixed uh, uh, evidence. 
Uh, and so that leads us me to my the next sort of instrument. Uh, the distribution of uh, times, uh, does that show that it's a homogeneous population or are there any indications of it being maybe two different mechanisms? Yeah, uh, so I, I wasn't wasn't going to go into, there's no, many, uh, many, there's, no. uh, many, many lines of evidence that are starting to make the FRB population look like it might be bifurcating into multiple multiple populations. Um, uh, there's, so the, the bursts that come from repeaters are morphologically different as well, which is a, a big hint. Um, I have backup slides that I can go into uh, on that. Is it, are, are people now going to a working hypothesis that you need multiple explanations for the FRB phenomenon? Uh, it's highly debated in the field. Um, so I will, as a... Uh, um, Just to add, uh, when we we're away with Wei Li, he was all on the globular cluster issue, so he seems to be a fan of of multiple populations being a, a source population as being a separate population. Well, a source population. Yeah, yeah, he was he was being outrageous, Wei Li, right? But it was fun. It was fun. Mm -hmm. So, 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 wouldn't it be great if we had thousands such localizations yeah. with with VLBI outriggers? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I planted it. Uh, okay. So, chimes weakness, right, is the resolution, right? So, even with these arc minute uncertainties, right, um, you can still fit the Hubble deep field inside of our uh, localization uncertainty region, meaning that you cannot, uh, with any confidence. Uh, usually you cannot associate, figure out what the host galaxy is, right? Uh, furthermore, um, you know, there's clearly two types of localization. One, you, so you could do traditional interferometry, which gets you down to like an arc second. And that's usually is good enough to figure out what, that will almost always be good enough to figure out what the host galaxy is, right? Because the, the angular size of a host gal of a galaxy is usually smaller than an arc, uh, usually of order an arc second. So an arc second should be good enough to figure out if you all you care about is what is the host. Um, but it sh but what would be even better is like a VLBI, very long baseline interferometry type localization, which gets you down to milli arc second scales. And that's where you get this detailed information about, oh, there's a star forming knot, but it's not quite in the star forming knot. Oh, it's in a globular cluster, so on and so forth. So you'd clearly you would prefer this type of localization over that type of localization, even though I know I'd take that one any day of the week if you were get, if you were if it was on offer. Um, okay, so uh, the outriggers program, the Chime VLBI uh, outriggers program, is uh, to build small copies of Chime uh, distributed all across North America that will work together with Chime to localize fast radio bursts using very long baseline interferometry. So um, each one of these outriggers is about a, uh, an eighth uh, of Chime's co total collecting area. Um, uh, it, the one in Green Bank, which is far to the east, that's going to have to be rolled on its side, right? So have, they have to see the same piece of sky that Chime sees. Chime looks straight up. Uh, straight up in the east is not straight up in the west. So you have to roll it over to the edge, on its edge, to see uh, the, right, the right part of the sky. Um, but otherwise, they're very, very similar in terms of op optical, analog, and digital uh, designs. Um, and so the goal here is to localize every... Chime detected F FRB, which is going to be thousands over the duration of the survey, to better than 50 milli arc seconds precision. Uh, so, um, but that's really, really hard. And the reason it's hard is that we don't know when or where our VLBI target is, right? So VLBI is typically a targeted technique. You typically know exactly what you're looking at before you look at it. And, and, and here we have to, we have, you know, our target could happen any moment, anywhere within our 200 square degree field of view. Uh, so in particular, um, you know, these challenges for this type of synoptic transient VLBI. So what, 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 what are those challenges? So one is just collecting the data, right? So this phase preserving data that you need to collect v VLBI, right? You can't get intensity. You need the phases because you're going to do interferometry between far separated uh, uh, telescope. Uh, and there's a fundamental scaling here that that um, data size goes as the field of view times the collecting area times the bandwidth. Right, uh, so you know the field of view times the collecting area. That's kind of like the mapping speed, or I mean, these together are like the mapping speed. This is the quantity that Chime was optimized to make big, right? So we we've built the telescope on purpose to make this data collection problem as hard as 
possible because that's how you map the universe and, and do a good FRB survey. So we've made that, that, that really hard. So actually the data rate for Chime is something like a hundred times EHT's data rate, which is, you know, an, an EHT data recorder is the highest bandwidth data, uh, VLBI data recorder in existence. Similarly, you've got uh, calibration issues, right? So you have to, you know, synchronize your clocks, you have to deal with the ionosphere. And you don't know, uh, these calibration issues are typically time and lo sky location dependent, right? And so you don't know where you're going to calibrate, you don't know when you're going to calibrate, and so you need always ready calibration solutions, right? And so this is a completely unprecedented way of doing VLBI. It's never been done before. Um, so uh, so th to solve this first problem, uh, we've already solved it actually, right? So we had, I've already shown you this baseband, triggered baseband recording system, which is over here. Uh, so that already exists on Chime. Right. For the outrigger, um, it's even simpler, right? I do the same thing, right? But I don't even bother pointing my telescope because there's no point, right? I, I know Chime's going to detect my FRBs. I just need the data to, to, to do the VLBI. So this, this telescope doesn't have a digital beamformer, doesn't point uh, digitally. It doesn't search for FRBs. It just sits there passively and buffers data. And then when Chime finds a, a burst, sends a trigger over the internet and, uh, and, and dumps its uh, data to disk. Right, and so that means uh, yes, we have to collect you know seven terabits of data per second. We only have to do it for a couple milliseconds every day, uh, and so that's fine. Uh, so then for the calibration problem, so right, and and to prototype all this, so um, uh, my lab and 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 uh, collaboration with uh, the uh, people folks uh, at working at here at Dunlap uh, and uh, and at West Virginia University um, sort of uh, prototyped. All these technologies uh, uh, using the uh, these instruments, both at ARO and in Green Bank, uh, 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 an array that was built for this purpose. Um, and so this, uh, we were that program was able to do the first VLBI localization of a fast radio burst at the time of detection. Right. So VLBI localizations of FRBs have been done for repeated for follow up of repeating FRBs, never in uh, the first detection of FRB. Um, we 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 did accomplish that with the, this this uh, uh, these these prototypes. Uh, you can see you have to it's a VLBI localization, so you have to zoom in twice before you can even see the 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 um, the uncertainty contours. Uh, and it's in this an edge on disk of a of a redshift point point one eight galaxy. Sorry, yeah, it's multimodal. There's a degeneracy as two pi phase degeneracies uh, give you multiple uh, give you multiple islands. But the systematic uncertainties are these big bands, so the statistical uncertainties are irrelevant anyway. And that's all calibration. Uh, okay, uh, but um, but we've moved past this prototyping stage at this point, right? So happening right now in BC, right, is um, uh, is the KKO outrigger, which is uh, in the midst of commissioning as we speak. Um, the Green Bank outrigger uh, exists, and we're uh, you know the rest of its instrument, the digital instrumentation is sitting in my lab at MIT right now. We're just waiting to be deployed. It should go out in the next month or so. Uh, and I won't show you a picture of the Hat Creek one because it's just a, 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 a muddy patch of dirt. But um, but uh, we're uh, should start digging the foundations relatively soon. It should go up pretty pretty fast once that happens. Uh, so the um, uh, remind me of how many of the outriggers there are? Where's the third? So, and Hat Creek, California. No, I got uh, this is uh, this is KKO. Uh, this is only eight, about 85 kilometers from Chime. So, Algonquin, permitting. A good enough site? Parks, Parks, Ontario. Parks, Ontario. So, the permitting was too hard. Oh. And so, this is the just from this Fifty milliarc seconds is um, is dominated by the two long baselines. So this is the shortest baseline. So this will give us sub arc second, but not fifty milliarc second. And it's once we have the two long baselines, uh, so the Green Bank and the California one will have fifty milliarc seconds. Uh, be just it's just triangular. There's two numbers I have to measure, right? Ra and dec, and so I need two baselines. Um, hope it should be, um, it should be, we should localize all of them over signal noise 12 at Chime, uh, and signal noise 12 is actually our criteria to dump baseband anyway. It's just that we have too many false positive to, to, to dump baseline below that. And, uh, so, so essentially all the ones for which we could conceivably localize, we should localize. There's, um, 
the the factor of one of an eighth in area actually doesn't hurt you as bad as you would think because it goes under a square root because it's the geometric mean of the areas that matter. And you get a factor of two back um, because you're measuring across to correlation. And so sort of like the in the binomial, there's a factor of two. And that factor of two gives you uh, gives you a factor of root two back in sensitivity. Uh, okay, so in the, my last, uh, well, five minutes, and it might be a minute or two over, I want to talk about something completely different, which is how to use FRBs as cosmological probes. Um, so uh, in particular, how to use dispersion for large-scale structure, right? So the power of this of dispersion is that it counts every free electron along the line of sight, uh, and therefore it counts every baryon along the line of sight, or at least 90% of them, because 90% of the baryons are ionized and in the diffuse component of the universe. Okay. Um, so first, you know, why do we expect, where do we expect those baryons to be? All right. So let's let's look, turn to simulations. Where do we expect the baryons to be on large and intermediate scale as in the universe? So I'm going to show you two simulations, illustrious and illustrious TNG. Right. So these are two simulations, uh, N body plus hydro. Um, you know, there's a megaparsec scale there. There's a redshift counter there that even I can't read. It's too small. It's not my fault. Uh, redshift four right now. Okay. And it's the same patch of the universe, right? So the same, uh, and so it's the same group, same patch of the universe. The only difference is these are run four years apart with different physics for the for subgrid grid physics for the feedback, right? Uh, and you can see they start off recognizably the same patch of the universe, but you know by the time we get to redshift, I think we're at two now. Uh, you see some morphological differences, right? You can still see that the same filament is there in the clusters. Um, but the baryon distribution, the statistics of it starts to diverge radically. Uh, you get to sort of redshift one, and the distance differences become more pronounced, right? Um, you see these feedback events, right? AGN and supernova feedback ejecting gas out, uh, out of the galaxies and clusters, right? And that is that is moving gas long distances, right? Dr dramatically changing the distribution of baryons on these megaparsic scales. You get down to redshift one, or zero, sorry, it's at redshift 0.28 right now. And these no longer are recognizable as the same patch of the universe, right? So if I if I were to show you the dark matter instead of the baryons here, they would be indistinguishable, right? They, the dark matter would look almost exactly the same in these two uh, simulations, but the baryons look wildly different in these two simulations, right? And so this is illustrating how uncertain the distribution of baryons is on, inter uh, on intermediate scales. Even the same group running the same patch of the universe can't uh, four years apart can't even, uh, can't come up with something that even looks remotely uh, similar. Okay, so why is this true? Why why do you get something so different? Uh, the answer is uh, feedback, right? So feedback is um, uh, feedback in galaxy formation, right? So the way that IGM you know stars are formed, right, is you have all the baryons are in the, this warm hot IGM gas phase, right, and it has to fall into potentials to cool radiatively and or to turn into cold gas reservoirs in the galaxies. Right, and only then can it form stars, right? And that's you know the process of galaxy formation. However, uh, once you start forming stars, you get feed, you get supernova that feeds back, right? And this thing that's supposed to look like an amplifier, you know, electric diagram kind of uh, for the radio astronomers in the room, um, uh, or uh, and that that will reheat the gas and subtract from uh, from the cold gas re reservoirs. Similarly, you can get uh, accretion. That same gas can accrete onto AGN and power AGN feedback, and that will inject momentum, stir up the gas, right? And that stirring up the gas will prevent uh, gas from settling into potentials and doing this cooling, and, uh, and therefore prevent, um, prevent uh, the, cut off the supply of gas, right? So this is very effective in regulating star formation in the universe. And in fact, it over-regulates star formation, right? That, you know, after redshift something like two, um, uh, uh, star formation essentially stops in the universe because feedback is so effect effective at, at over-regulating. Um, so why is so why do we know so little about how exactly the details of how feedback works? And the, the, the problem is that disrupts the cooling of the IGM, right? That's what feedback is doing. Um, uh, and that stars galaxy, the cold gas that needs for uh, for feeding stars. But the thing we observe when we try to calibrate our feedback models, those are stars and gas and galaxies, right? Um, but those are secondary results of feedback, right? The primary result of feedback is stirring the IGM itself. Right. And so you have to go around this feedback loop, you know, a few times before I get an observable. Right. And it's not this process down here that uh, and the IGM that, that you're observing. 
Um, so, uh, so this is, in fact, the missing baryon problem, right? Uh, so, you know, the IgM contains all the baryons in the universe. They can't be observed. They can't be simulated. And so we don't know where they are, right? So it's just synonymous with the missing baryon problem. Uh, and uh, and FRBs can help because we can measure statistically where the IgM is by proxy of those free electrons. Okay. And furthermore, we can measure where the IgM is in relationship relations to the red and blue galaxies in the universe. Uh, so how would that work in detail? So uh, what you would do is you'd get a DM map from the background FRBs and a galaxy map from foreground galaxies. Okay. Uh, you could spherical harmonic transform these, cross-correlate them, and measure this quantity, which is CL DMG. Uh, if um, so, if, if none of this cosmology speak means anything to you, don't worry about it. This is like you know a little bit technical, but uh, the point is I get to measure that there's a simple transformation that goes from uh, this CL to the thing that you would ultimately like to measure, which is PEG, the cross power spectrum between free electrons, i.e. the baryons in galaxies. Uh, and, um, and this is encodes the detailed statistics uh, on intermediate scales of where the baryons are, right? And, and therefore of feedback. Okay. Uh, so this was, this type of analysis was proposed before, but in, in a different context, in the context of the KSZ. Um, but I think that, that this measurement is especially informative for feedback physics. Uh, and then if you're a hardcore cosmologist and you get, don't care about, um, about you know, astrophysics uh, and, and, and stuff like that, you should still care about this measurement um, because uh, these uh, electrons, if you know where the electrons are, uh, you break a degeneracy and the, um, and the KSZ effect, right? So for the cosmology types, you might, if you want to use the KSC effect to measure velocities, you need to know where the electrons are, right? So that's that's what was proposed in these original forecasts. Uh, and in addition, the IGM contaminates weak lensing, right? Um, so the IGM is 14% of the matter in the universe. Uh, and its power spectrum on these scales is order unity uncertain, right? And so you can't do precision weak lensing measurements without knowing what the baryons are doing, right? That's the precision limiting step for weak lensing surveys. Uh, so unless you understand the feedback, you can't do percent level of cosmology uh, uh, or measurements of dark matter or dark energy with weak lensing. Um, and furthermore, if you uh, like near field cosmology, um, then baryons can back react on the dark matter, right? They can sort of uh, strip halos or tidally disrupt them or whatever, right? And so if you're uh, trying to look for um, sort of subtle effects in dark matter clustering to go after spicy dark matter or warm dark matter, uh, then you also need to understand uh, 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 baryon feedback much better than we currently do. Uh, because currently those, you know, th those constraints are all sort of uh, 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 a little bit uncertain because, because we don't understand the astrophysics. Uh, okay, so I'm not too late. Great. Uh, so um, in conclusion, fast rate airbursts are this, you know, this mysterious high energy phenomena uh, that are originating from compact object, objects. Chime is discovering thousands of these things. Uh, we're starting to understand the population and this magnetar progenitor um, uh, uh, hypothesis is now favored from this direct association and other evidence, but there's actually mixed evidence uh, from the environments. Uh, however, you know, uh, uh, the VLBI outriggers program is going to be here soon. It's going to be providing thousands of localizations and redshifts and should really uh, you know, give us a much more holistic view on what's happening with the environments. Uh, and then on a completely different tack, this same FRB data will finally measure the large scale or rather intermediate scale baryon distribution, uh, solving a key uncertainty in large scale structure evolution uh, and, and then therefore in cosmology. Thank you very much. For a couple of questions, yeah. So I was wondering, uh, in this exciting program to measure the uh, IGM, if you have some correlations between the rate of formation of FRBs in a galaxy and a star formation rate or feedback rate, how could that complicate the... Uh... So you should do the same thing you do in galaxy, in galaxy uh, shear weak lensing, which is just make sure that your background FRBs are far away from the foreground galaxies you're, uh, you're, you're uh, correlating with. And then they shouldn't, then you just wipe out the clustering and you're, you're fine. So yeah, in fact, FRBs themselves are, expect, are, are definitely expected to be clustered with, you know, they live in galaxies, galaxies live in halos, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, presumably. 
I mean, and you, so you, you're hypothesizing that the FRBs will typically be displaced from the centers of the host galaxies. No, not, not even. I'm just saying, I don't care where the FRB is. I'm just going to make sure that when I cross correlate, I'm going to choose galaxy FRB pairs that are separated by, I don't know, a gigaparsec in, in the line of sight direction. And therefore they don't correlate intrinsically themselves. The only thing that correlates them is the line of sight effects, which is the DM. Can I ask quickly, uh, when are the uh, outriggers going to be producing results? Um, I think, uh, uh, okay, producing results and collecting that and doing science are different questions. Um, so we are historically um, pretty bad at getting our results out in a timely manner. Um, so we should be operating in science mode very soon. So uh, months, not years. Uh, and then our, um, so, you know, if you, I don't know, uh, get a, have enough beer with uh, members of the team. You maybe you'll make some progress uh, on getting the results, but actually getting them into print will take us a little bit more time. Cool. Uh, just okay. working. Uh, could I uh, just go back a bit? So you gave two illustrious, uh, actually it was pretty interesting. Your TNG looked like it had crazier feedback than the pre-TNG, which didn't have, uh, which, which had pretty bad feedback as well. So feedback bad. But um, the issue is if it's just an E that's one is interested in, then there is, this is to a large extent associated with just uh, radiation, not, uh, not actual physical motion. Uh, on, uh, no, I mean, what it's reflecting is there statistics in NE is associated with the clumping of NE, but that, you know, I mean, nobody would say that the universe isn't largely reionized right now in most of the regions, right? Because of just the radiation that's come from stars of various sorts. Yeah, but I, I don't think there's, I mean, certainly there's patchiness in the ionization fraction, but I think, you know, when, 90% of the baryons are ionized. That's going to be subdominant to the patchiness in just the baryon. Like certainly in, in the in the limit that that all that the ionization fraction is 100%, the NE um, power spectrum is just the baryon power spectrum, period, right? And then you know when the baryons are 90% ionized, yeah, I've missed some stars in dust and galaxies and that's it, right? Actually, given that there hasn't been a, it's a subdominant effect. It's mainly an ionized medium. And then the question is, how are the electrons actually clumped? So um, I, I'm just saying that it's supposed to be one of the easier things to get out of hydro sims. <laughs> I mean, sure, great. <laughs> I mean, we're interested in this here and you're interested in, neutral hydrogen, that's got complications, especially in the various form it's in, but the free electron abundance shouldn't be that wildly unknown. Uh, I, I mean, remember, we're, we're, this is on scale. This is on megaparsec scales, right? So certainly on scales larger than you can move an electron, it has to be the matter power spectrum, right? Um, on scales where once you get down to small enough scales that you can physically move an electron or a baryon from yeah, okay. the galaxy, then you can yeah. you can change the, the power spectrum arbitrarily, right? And I, we did these measurements with actually an earlier version of a list. Um, and uh, yeah, there is a form factor. Uh, I agree with that. Um, but I, anyway, we can talk about this later. It's just that it's not clumping that you're into, it's just ionization. No, the electro, the ionization, the the patchiness in the iron, the only patchiness that in the ionization is would be just you know there's a small ten percent of the baryons that are actually in the galaxies and you're gonna miss those sure and you'll miss them for two reasons one is they're not ionized and the second reason is even the ionized ISM is you know, it, it, its cross-section is minuscule because it's way deep in the galaxy, right? And so, uh, and so the FRBs typically don't pass through them. NE, it, it, the, the line of sight integral of NE is just measuring the uh, projected surface density. Yeah, of the baryon density. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying NE and the baryon density are 
to 90% precision, the same thing. And then at the 10% level, you miss some of the stars and dots and, 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 and ISM inside, inside galaxies, deep inside galaxies. Density is just what um, weak lensing measures. Exactly. So all of this interplays. Well, I guess that's what the game is to bring them all together and make a coherent story. Exactly right. Or uh, put another way is um, if weak lensing is after the uh, measures the matter power spectrum, and what you want is an observable that I can go from cosmological parameters to 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 uh, to prediction for that observable. And as long as baryons are in play, that is just not possible. Uh, and so you would, uh, if you separately measure the baryons, then I can subtract those off, or you know. Or, or, uh, and then I can get get to my dark matter, which is so much easier to model. I'm going to have to make you ask this question upstairs with cookies. Sorry.